Hello and welcome to our new conference with Fundación Radica. Today we have the great pleasure of being here with Professor, with Professor Tish Jennings, who is I'm going to read so that I make sure that I don't miss any of your wonderful things. She is an internationally recognized professor of education in social and emotional learning and mindfulness. She is now based at the University of Virginia, which is where she mainly teaches. She developed the CARE program, C-A-R-E, a mindfulness-based professional development program shown to improve teacher well-being, classroom interactions, and student engagement. It is the largest randomized controlled trial of a mindfulness-based intervention designed specifically to address teacher occupational stress. Tish is the co-author of Flourish, the Compassionate Schools Project Curriculum, and among many other publications, she is the author of trauma, The Trauma-Sensitive Classroom, Building Resilience with Compassionate Teaching, which is the reason that we're here today. Thank you so much for being with us, Tish, for such an important subject, such an essential subject, uh, and I really appreciate all the work you do. I was thinking of this CARE program, and the care that you put in something that is so important for our teachers, and for the students, so for the future and for those people that are in charge largely for the future. Thank you, Maria. I really appreciate you inviting me here today. So I was thinking, although it's words that we all hear, that I would love to hear your definition of both trauma and chronic stress, because both of them will come into the conversation today. Would that be okay? Yes, yes. So you're, you're right, there, there, um, there's kind of a range of um, distressing experiences we can have as human beings, ranging from extreme traumatic incidents, like the death of somebody, some, where, where somebody's life is threatened, an accident, a serious, serious accident, um, to ongoing adversity. Um, for example, living in poverty, or living in a violent context. Um, the two of them, um, interact in many ways because if you live in a high poverty community where there's a lot of violence, you're more apt to experience a traumatic event. Um, or if you live in a family context where you're not getting your needs met for one reason or another, like your parent has mental health problems or, you know, severe poverty, um, you're more likely to experience a traumatic event. Um, when you have been exposed to trauma and these ongoing adverse experiences, you learn strategies to cope because human beings are incredibly resilient. Um, so in the face of trauma, in the face of adversity, we, we harness a lot of capacities to adapt to these kinds of situations. Um, and that those kinds of adaptive functions can help us recover, respond to these traumatic events but they can also make it difficult to function in other contexts sometimes. So we can talk a little bit more about that too. So this is obviously an essential thing because it is affecting the most vulnerable beings, which are our children, correct? And often, especially when we're talking about chronic stress, it's if the children are being affected, it's because the parents are being affected too. So perhaps they're not always getting the support that they need at home and the school becomes an essential place for them to maybe get that place as a place of having food and having a place to sit and a place of safety and calm, right? So I thought that maybe we could begin by seeing what are the main effects that we see in our children in the school? How are they affected behaviorally, socially, and academically? Yeah, so first of all, um... When a, when a child experiences something uh, traumatic, um, they're, depending on their age and, you know, and, and their ability to manage, um, the strong emotions that they may encounter in themselves are just intolerable. Um, if you think about it as adults, when we face those kinds of traumas, it's very hard for us. For a young child, they just don't have the capacity. Um, and so, there are different ways that young children cope. One of them is something called dissociation, where you basically kind of shut down. Um, you, I'm actually a survivor of trauma, childhood trauma, and I remember 
shutting down. I remember the feeling of, it was almost like I was underwater. I couldn't really hear people. I couldn't focus my attention. I was really spaced out, I would say. I think what I must have looked like from the outside was that nobody was home, you know? And it was a way of numbing myself to the pain. Um, because it was just unbearable. Um, so that's one way that, that students respond to that. Um, it's an internalizing process. Um, some people, and in some contexts, um, react by being more um, externalizing, by trying to protect, by doing something more active, like um, being hyper vigilant, like constantly worrying that somebody's going to do something. And so Sometimes kids, when they're in this state, this hypervigilant state, sometimes they get misdiagnosed with ADHD because they seem distracted and they can't focus their attention. In either case, it's very hard to focus on academic work when you're dissociated and kind of spaced out or hypervigilant and hyperreactive. Both of those make it hard to learn. And they're often, those behaviors are often misunderstood. I remember as a child being dissociated and being called stupid, you know, uh, so a teacher would misunderstand me being in this state and thinking, um, also being in a state like that as a child, I remember conversations going on that I wasn't following peer conversations and then laughter and then worrying that they're laughing at me because I don't remember, I couldn't track what they were saying. And so I often felt um, embarrassed and ashamed and confused. And um, and I know, you know, from working with kids that were more um, uh, hypervigilant, uh, they are often criticized for not paying attention, for being um, distractible. They also, the, another um, defense mechanism is uh, how you appraise threat. So if you live in a very threatening context, you're going to be hyper, um, you're gonna appraise threat more uh, over, you're gonna over appraise situations of threat. So you're gonna assume threat where there may not be. So a student in a classroom might, um, somebody might bump into them accidentally and their first immediate response is to maybe hit them because they immediately assume that was intentional. Um, so there's this sort of overreactivity um, that you often also see. Um, and you can tell, you can see how, if you're living in a context like this, that that would be adaptive. You know, um, it gets you through the pain and suffering and keeps you alive, but it makes learning in a classroom and being socially engaged in a classroom really, really hard, especially if you don't feel safe. Because if you're coming from a, a lack of safety, you're coming into a school where you still don't feel safe and you don't trust your teachers and you don't trust your peers, it's easy to just kind of either like I did sort of shut down or be constantly defensive on the defense. So often I think as educators, we don't, we misinterpret what's going on um, and think that this behavior is misbehavior. It's not really misbehavior <laughs> because it is intended to survive in a certain context, not not these classroom contexts. So there are so many things that you touched upon. The first one is I would like to thank you for sharing your, your own personal experience with us. And I know that it definitely reached my heart and, 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 uh, and moved something in there. Um, and the next one is that when you mention ADHD or being stupid, right? How these labels or even diagnosis, right? So um, are being given out without really looking at what is going on. And the third thing that I wanted to ask you was, which I, is in your book also, is as another coping mechanism, is another extreme, which is perfectionism and trying to control those things. Would they, what, is that something that, you, that would also fall in there? Oh yeah, I mean, um, when one of the biggest um, feelings in the midst of trauma is lack of control. Um, so yeah, being able to f control a situation as best you can, which is hard for kids because kids don't have a lot of control anyway. So um, trying to find ways to control your context. And sometimes that can mean avoiding things because 
and you know, and I followed this in my own adulthood, and I know I'm not alone. I know there's lots of people who have trauma histories, yeah. And you know, and as you um, you grow up, you learn to either uh, only engage in context where you know you can be successful and avoid anything that might be threatening at all. So you somehow limit what you do, or you develop these um, controlling uh, strategies like overthinking everything. Like, oh, I can figure all of this out in advance if I just, you know, and then I'll be safe because I'll be able to, you know. And so, yeah, and I think that's kind of goes along with this perfectionism. So we as adults carry this trauma with us in our bodies, you know. And so I, it's taken years of therapy for me to get past some of these habitual tendencies that come from growing up in trauma. Yeah. How we can like learn from them and heal them at the same time, right? And that's possible. It definitely is possible. Um, you know, the thing I do think about a lot though, Maria, is if anybody had even known that I was experiencing this trauma in my school context, which they, I mean, that's kind of one of the things about trauma is we tend to hide it because we feel ashamed of it, right? So we don't let people in the school know that what's going on at home because it's shameful. Um, and so the, the teachers didn't know what was going on with me. And so I didn't get the kind of support I could have gotten. But now we know that educators in school contexts can make a huge difference in supporting kids' recovery from trauma. And, we, and I'm hopeful that our next generation of children will have more support. Um, and now in our society, it's well recognized what trauma does to you across your lifespan. So now people understand it. People have a lot better um, understanding of how to support people when they're going through this and how they, to recover from it across your whole lifespan. Yes, as you're saying, the school can be a fundamental place for these children that are either going through specific trauma or through chronic stress to find out that there is other types of relationships, other types of lives, other types of spaces. And people who, so for me as a kid, uh, my my mother had really serious mental health problems. And so to get to know other adults that don't have mental health problems that are mentally healthy and emotionally healthy could be can be really valuable because you can see that there are other options, you know, that everybody's not like that. So why don't we go into I mean, you started going into it, but maybe you want to go into it in more detail. So we can begin to see what we can do about this as teachers or as school systems. What should teachers and school systems be looking out for? What type of behaviors or attitudes can we look out for that might give us an idea into that this child is going through pain? It's a really good question. Um, and first of all, I, a lot of times when people ask me, a question like that, they often are looking for some way of identifying or diagnosing or screening or however. And I always say, I, I don't think we can really do that um, for many reasons. Um, and I don't think we need to, because even once we do notice this, which is important, you can start to say, well, I this behavior might be rooted in trauma. Um, but I don't have to confirm that because the way in which I interact with that child is beneficial to all children. So the way I think about trauma sensitive approaches is at a universal level that if we can treat everybody with the same kind of kindness and compassion and understanding, um, not, not only will we help everybody, including the trauma exposed kids, but we'll prepare everybody because we all could, you know, at any moment experience trauma, you know, in the school you're working and there could be, God forbid, a shooting like here in the U.S. happens all the time. Or there could be an earthquake, you know, or whatever. So, you know, if we feel connected to our community and we've built a social environment that is nurturing and warm and, and, um, and supportive for everybody, then we're more resilient, we're more able to respond effectively and help everybody um, rather than, uh, you know, reacting in ways that aren't going to be helpful. So um, I think looking out for the kind of behaviors I was describing, um, 
you know, if, if a student isn't engaged, like I was describing, and they're acting like dissociated, um, helping in either case, in that case or in the hypervigilant case, helping them um, feel like they are safe and seen and appreciated and valued. I think um, that is kind of core to us as human beings. As human beings, if you think about us and you think about our human history, somehow, this is what anthropologists think, we got from a group of about 10,000 human beings on the East Coast of Africa to the whole entire globe with all these different cultures and societies in 70,000 years. Somehow we did that. And we did that because we had very strong communities, because obviously we couldn't do that by ourselves. And so human beings are social creatures. We need each other. We need to feel like we belong. Um, and we need to feel like we have value to our community. So one of the best things we can do is see everyone for who they are, value them for who they are, give them opportunities to contribute what they have and honor that contribution and value that contribution. That is core to us as human beings. And when we have that, we feel like we can do anything. Um, and obviously we can, otherwise we wouldn't have covered the globe the way we have. Um, so today I think one of our problems is we've become disconnected from one another. You know, our societies have created situations that don't build these capacities. Uh, and I think this is something we need to shift. Another thing I think we need to shift is, obviously we evolved in a context where our communities were very small and were very homogeneous. You know, we looked the same, we had the same language, we had the same religion, um, and when we ran into people who didn't look like us or talk like us or whatever, it would often mean war, right? And now today, we can't go there. We have to recognize that all of us on this planet, wherever we are, are part of the same human family. And we need to show each other the same respect no matter where we are um, and build this sense of community worldwide. It's because we are, as, as a species, threatened together, um, you know? So this is a new, a new need that we have, survival need that is, is new to human beings because we've never had a universal threat like we have today. Yeah, you with know when you brought anthropology, it was making me think of these bones that were found. Uh, there's, there's a near Madrid in Spain. There's a, a place where there's remains from hundreds and thousands of years ago. And they found the bones from when they were still nomads and moving around of this 10 year old girl who obviously had brain damage, but she lived to the age of 10, which speaks to what you were saying of our innate quality to look after others, to be compassionate and to be seen and valued regardless of who we are. It is there. Right, and there is a part of us that needs to that needs to refine that. And also, when you're saying that we are now a global community and that we're facing a common problem, actually, because of globalization, what anthropologists are saying is yes, we need to work together, because now we are so together that we are of the fact that we are one species. Whatever comes is going to affect us all. While before we were a little different, so something affected some and not others, but now we're all the same. So we need to stick together and work together. <laughs> For sure. One thing that I've been drawing upon in, in the work I do is um, Paul Gilbert, who's a um, British psychologist, has come up with these three uh, survival systems, which I think are important to point out. Um, we all are pretty familiar with the threat system, the fight, flight, or freeze system. This is the part that allows us to survive physical threat. Um, and, you know, when we're, when we are... Um, physically threatened, like attacked or, you know, like an, it, it evolved in the context of lions chasing after us, and, you know, um, our heart rate goes up, our um, autonomic nervous system just goes into high gear, uh, we can run fast, we could, we can fight strong, all of that happens, our adrenaline goes up. Um, so that's the threat system. 
Then there's the affiliation system, which is what we were just talking about, which is this feeling of connection, which uh, we believe evolved from our uh, parent child attachment system and evolved into this attachment system that is community based so that we can support our 10 year olds, even if they have brain damage. Right. Um, and, be, and if you think about that, too, um, as a mother, and I know you're a mother, too, you think about our babies and now I have a grandbaby. How would they survive without all the attention we have to put into getting them to adulthood? It's a lot of work. So human beings require this kind of nurturing. Um, to have our children <laughs> grow up and survive, but also as a community, we need it. And the, um, the affiliation system is the compassion that we can bring to others, that feeling of connection, that feeling of soothing ourselves. So soothing our nervous system, calming ourselves down um, so that we can recover from the you know, stress and threat. Um, and then there's the, um, the uh, 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 I can't remember it. The freeze and submit you might be going into. Could that be it? It's um, the uh, well, it's the system that, that, that motivates, drive, sorry, the drive system. It motivates us to accomplish things. So it motivates us, it, you know, to go hunting for food or, you know, keep us moving along or building our cultures and exploring the world. You know, it's drive. Um, what I see in our culture, which I know is not, we're not alone, is that we have accentuated the threat system in many, many ways. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this because I see our media intentionally triggers the threat system as a way to get us to buy stuff or to vote in a certain way or whatever they want us to do. Um, they know that, you know, that advertising companies know this, they know how to make us feel threatened so that we will feel like we have to buy something new or we have to do this or that. So um, it, it, we, all of us are living in this situation where our threat response is hyper, hyper alert in a way that we don't really need to anymore. I mean, there are not any lions chasing me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the other thing is our threat response kicks in in contexts where we feel socially threatened and so if if like for as a teacher i experienced this i have a limited amount of time i have to get through this lesson the student over here is interrupting me and immediately i feel threatened because i'm not going to get my lesson done well that feeling of threat isn't helping me at all it's not helping my student it's not helping him learn me teach nothing so today i feel like we need to learn how to become more aware when we are feeling this triggered response and intentionally calm ourselves down so that we can make choices about how to respond intentionally rather than reacting automatically, especially for children who are exposed to trauma. Because let's say that student who's interrupting me is distracted for some reason because he's feeling threatened because he's hypervigilant, he can't or he can't find what he needs to do something, who knows. But if I jump on him and overreact and react in anger, which is a tendency that I might have because of this punitive tendency in our society to be reactive and punish, and be punitive. If I do that, he, it's going to reinforce his feeling of threat. It's going to reinforce his feeling of lack of safety. And he may react to me in a way that reinforces that. So he might shut down, right? You know, and then, and then I'm I'm thinking, well, now he's not paying attention to me, right? <laughs> or he might get hypervigilant and become more disruptive. <laughs> and in either case, it's reinforcing my perception that he's misbehaving, right? Instead of maybe me just stopping, taking a breath, noticing that I probably won't get it done anyway, and that's okay. <laughs> And then I might actually see what's really happening in front of me, because the other thing we now know is when I'm in that the heat of that stressful moment, I'm not as able to see what's really going on. Um, we know psychologically that when we're in that state, our minds and our bodies reinforce it for us as a way to keeping keeping the threat response elevated so we'll survive. So I might be telling myself 
oh, there he goes again. He's always making my life difficult. Those thoughts are reinforcing my feeling of threat um, to keep me that threat response elevated. But in that context, it's not helpful. But when I notice it, when I go, oh, there it goes, there I go again. <laughs> and I stop and I calm down and, and, and I respond to that student in a way that's helpful. Or I might not even, I might just ignore it because it might not even be important at all. Um, what I've noticed over time is that can have a positive reinforcing cycle because the student will have that moment to be able to take to figure out whatever it is that they need. They won't feel defensive. Um, and my relationship with that student will be a positive influence rather than a reactive negative influence. So in these little mini interactions that we have as educators between um, the students, those are where we build these affiliations or these feelings of threat. And so the more we understand this and, and the more aware we are of ourselves and our um, internal responses, both physically and emotionally and mentally, then we can be more intentional in how we respond. Yes, which is making me think of your care program, right? Because what you're talking is very much about mindfulness, no? about being able to take that step back and say, okay, what's going on here, right? Yeah, because mindfulness, you know, so mindfulness is a state of mind that people have naturally. It's not like anything magical. Um, some people are naturally more mindful than others, but we can cultivate mindfulness with practice. And it's intentionally cultivating awareness of the present moment, but also cultivating an attitude of acceptance and curiosity, like, oh, what's happening here? Um, and being able to, it's almost like taking a step back and going, okay, what's going on here? Um, and sometimes it just means taking a breath, taking a, and noticing, the thing I notice too is if I can bring myself into my body as I'm doing that, like feeling my feet on the ground or taking a breath, bringing attention into the physical body helps kind of bring you to the present automatically. Um, so it's not something that's that hard to do in the moment. Um, if you practice it on your own, either, um, you know, practicing, focusing on your breath for five minutes during the day um, or many, many other ways to do it, um, it can build your capacity to be able to do it in the moment when you need to. So as we enter this terrain of, let's call it compassionate and mindful teaching, right? Um, much of what we are talking about at the moment has more to do with the teacher and their own reactions than with the student and how we deal with the student. So maybe we could separate in order to make it a trauma sensitive classroom. What can the teacher do for themselves? And then what can the teacher do for the student? So I think the first thing that educators can do for themselves is to take care of themselves. And, it, you know, as caregivers, we often overlook that for ourselves. And in some, you know, depending on where you're from, there are there's educator cultures that basically um, dismiss self-care as something that's selfish, you know. And I think we all have to see that what we do and who we are is key to what we do and if it's if we don't take care of ourselves and we're exhausted and we are needs are not getting met then it's going to be really hard to um to help care for our students so and and if we're stressed out at because of other demands in our lives or we're not getting what we need then we'll be less um, resilient in the classroom in these moments so um so taking care of ourselves and if you are a trauma survivor that can be challenging and it's taken me a long time to learn this. But as I grew up, I got messages that caring for myself or that my needs were not valued. When I had a need, I sometimes would get punished for having that need. So you get this message like, oh, those needs are not OK. You know, if I'm, you know, and then you lose touch with what those needs are <laughs> because you've suppressed any ability to recognize them. And I have spent my whole life uncovering this, like uh, discovering this, like, oh, this is what hunger feels like. Oh, this is when I'm tired. That's what it feels like. 
oh, this is, you know, whatever it is. But we have these human needs, and I like to think about them in different ways. So there's the physical needs like hunger, sleep, things like that, exercise. But then there's also emotional needs. Um, we need contact with other people that is enjoyable, social time. We need to do things like enjoy humor with people. Like we know from a lot of emotion research that when human beings get together and do fun things together, they feel so good and so connected. So if we can remember that, because we often in our modern worlds are isolated, we don't take time to go and socialize and have fun together. Um, and then there's also intellectual um, uh, needs that we have. So learning something that's different um, or ch a challenge that might be something completely out of the realm that we're used to so that we're enjoying something different. Um, and then there's spiritual needs. And when I talk about spiritual need, I mean, ranging from religious practices and experience to completely secular experiences in nature where you feel connected to something bigger than yourself in whatever way that you want to do that, um, whatever works best for you. But we all need to care for ourselves in all these different ways um, because otherwise we just run out of steam, basically, um, to do everything we're doing. Um, then um, learning these practices, learning mindfulness, um, learning some compassion practices. Um, the compassion practices that we do in like the care program come from the Tibetan Buddhist metta practice or uh, other Buddhist practices that are intentionally cultivating feelings of compassion for others. Um, and some you can, if you, in the English, we often call it loving kindness practice. So you can Google that and find lots of examples of this. But um, what we know is that when you intentionally experience uh, a cultivation of care, a feeling of care for another, um, it, it actually feels really good. And it helps you be ready to um, deploy that feeling of compassion when you need to. The other thing we know from research that I find really fascinating is empathy um, can be distressing. Because if I'm noticing a, somebody else suffering, a student, let's say, um, and I know their history and I know what's going on, I can feel overwhelmed with pain when I empathize, right? Um, and, and, but in, in contrast, when I feel compassion, which is more of a desire to help, then that feels good. And my friend, Tanya Singer, who's a professor at Max Planck Institute in, in, uh, in Berlin, has discovered that the ways our brains respond to both those two are very different. So when we feel empathy, sometimes the pain part of our brain is activated. Whereas when we feel compassion, um, the reward part of our brain lights up. So if we can learn as educators to shift that feeling of empathy into these feelings of compassion by practicing compassion exercises, um, we're more, uh, we can be more resilient and we can be more helpful because if I'm very distressed emotionally because of my empathy, I'm not going to be very much help. Um, so that's how I see these mindfulness practices and compassion practices being very helpful for building our capacity and taking care of ourselves as well. As I was listening to you uh, talking about empathy and compassion, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I was thinking that this empathy, uh, awakens the pain network a lot more if it's something that has to do with our own history and what role our own history plays and how as teachers we must keep that in mind that we can keep that in mind that we can use them as places to learn and explore outside the classroom and not with the children what do you what what do you think of this Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of research now on um, sometimes it's called vicarious trauma, which is, you know, being exposed to trauma. And it, and you don't necessarily have to even have a trauma history to feel that vicarious trauma. But if you do have a trauma history, it, it there's some evidence that it can activate your own trauma. So you can feel re-traumatized. It can trigger um, trauma within yourself. And so I think being aware of the fact that that's a possibility and um, and taking care of ourselves. So, so if you do have a trauma history, I think it's important to have uh, make sure that your trauma is being treated. 
um, professionally if 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 it's if it's interfering with your ability to function well, which can happen in these kinds of contexts. Um, and so, first of all, recognizing that that you might need support that outside of your normal um, self care practices, um, and then get accessing it if you can, when you can, and then giving yourself space. I think this is another part that the mindfulness and compassion can be helpful is if we give ourselves a little space, um, like a little, like a breather, sometimes I call it, you know, give ourselves a little space because especially if you're an over perfectionist, like you were talking, you know, you're always going to be, I've got to do this. I got it. Sometimes you just need to go, wait a minute. I need a break. I need a moment. I need to stop. I need to reassess what's going on. I need to just like give myself some space. Um, I think if we can give ourselves that kind of space, it's very powerful. It's the, I might not finish the lesson today that yes. you were saying about earlier, right? I mean, it may not be possible to be perfect right now. <laughs> so you've been talking a lot about what the teacher can do for themselves in order to be a more trauma sensitive teacher. Um, and you've already started saying some of the things that the teacher can do towards the students. You spoke about punishment. I wouldn't mind if you want to go into it again. But I know that there's other elements that you have found essential in, in how we treat the children in order to make it more trauma sensitive. Maybe you want to go into four of those points uh, so that we can have them clearly. Sure. Um, well, obviously, the more we're able to build these, this feeling of community. Um, and, you know, social emotional learning has become really popular these days. And there's lots of activities you can do in social emotional learning to build a feeling of community in a classroom, in a school. Um, so building that a, at this classroom level, but also at the school level. And this will also involve all the adults need to feel like they are part of a community, too, because you can't create a community for students if the adults are not modeling this. Yes. Um, this is another thing that I, I think is really critical is we kids learn social emotional skills by watching us. And so we might tell them, you know, that they should behave this way. But if we don't behave that way, then what they're really learning is what we're showing them, not what we're telling them. Um, so as a community, we all need to be mindful of how we're interacting with one another and with the students as well. Um, so building that that feeling of community looking at the ways in which we manage behavior um, our systems because most schools have some policy around behavior now one thing we lived through at the united states which was horrible was like we call it zero tolerance so a student does one thing and they're out basically and that kind of response is horrible and it has caused a lot of problems and most of the places now don't do that anymore because it did not work we need to understand what's going on with students before we resort to anything like that. I'm noticing nowadays that schools are doing more things like, I just visited a school here locally uh, last week where they have something called the Zen Den. <laughs> and it's a place where students can go and calm down when they need to. It's a beautiful room. It has all kinds of stuff in it for them to do, including an exercise bike. If they need to get out some energy, they have Play-Doh, they have fidget toys, they have places they can lie down and put a headphones on so they can just, you know, call, whatever they need, if it's physical activity or calming activity, and there's a teacher in there all day long that helps kids understand what they need in that moment like and they and they're given i think maybe 15 or 20 minutes in that space when they need to and she always tells them now that you've had a chance to have your time when you go back um you know you need to show your teacher that you're doing better so that they'll keep using this space to help you right and she says it works really well um, also in classrooms nowadays, uh, in our Compassionate Schools Project curriculum, we have something called the pause place, P-A-U-S-E place, but sometimes they make it like a paw, like an animal paw as a, <laughs> as kind of a, uh, a joke on that. But that pause place is a place kids can intentionally go and sit when they need to calm down. And calming down is something that we teach as part of the curriculum because you know we tell our children all the time calm down and pay attention but we don't teach them how to do that so even just simple practices for saying well this is how you calm down you take slow mindful breaths 
Let's do this together. Whew. You know, that's how you calm yourself down. Sometimes we use uh, this Hoberman sphere as a way to sort of model inhaling and exhaling. And with young kids, this works well because they can focus their eyes on it. And they can also take turns doing this, which they love. Um, we can use other kinds of models like, like a glitter jar where we say to them, so sometimes you might feel really like your mind is swirling like this and your body, your emotions are all stirred up. But if you just take a few deep breaths, it'll clear and you'll be able to see it clearly. So these are ways to teach kids how to calm down. And then there's simple ways to teach attention. Um, we often use a bell uh, like this, where we just simply ring the bell and have them listen to it uh, and see how long they can hear the sound. So they're focusing on something. And if you do these calming and focusing practices in the morning in school at the beginning, you've got their attention and they're calm. A lot of times what I say when we do this is, when you don't hear the sound anymore, open your eyes and look at me, and then you have their attention. I do have to say, sometimes trauma-exposed kids don't wanna close their eyes, and that is fine. I say either close your eyes or look down or whatever, because if you don't feel safe, it's hard to close your eyes. Uh, so I wouldn't wanna insist that they do that. So, you know, simple ways of building students' capacities to be more mindful and aware and calm um, and then we also do activities to help build this feeling of compassion. Um, we teach them exactly what is compassion. Um, and a lot of it has to do with being kind and caring for others and noticing when other people need help. And now in some of the schools where we're doing this, they create a compassion board where when a student feels like somebody's been kind to them and done something nice for them, or when they've done something nice for someone else, they write it down on a piece of paper, sometimes like a heart shape, and they stick it up on the board. And so pretty soon they have like a whole board full of kindness on the wall. Um, and so we can, we can teach this in our schools and in our classroom. Um, and going back to discipline, we have to make sure that whatever processes we have in place are not punitive because you you can support behavior by encouragement by reinforcement by reminding we don't have to be punitive if if a student does need time out we can give them time out without making it a punishment um, it can become a norm look you know when you can't function very well you need to take a time out or a time in <laughs> you could call it that. Um, so it's not seen as being excluded or punished or, or whatever, um, but it's seen as what we all need as human beings sometimes, you know, because sometimes we all have need time in or time out. <laughs> um, yes, because you've spoken about it both for the teachers and for the students, right? So it's again also going back to that modeling, you know, that ability to take a step back, see how things go back into place. I also know that you place a lot of attention on clarity and on choice. Do you want to take a quick look at those two? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about choice and then I'm going to ask you about clarity. So choice, um, and another way to think about this is autonomy or mastery. Like we know from all the psychological research these days that autonomy is really key to well-being. If I don't have choice about what I do um, in it, it, it's it's hard to feel like you have any agency or ability to do anything. I think one of the biggest problems in our school systems, not just the U.S., but many places, is the students have very little autonomy. They have very little choice. Um, same with teachers. In our culture here, a lot of teachers have very little choice. I think this is an area where our schools really need to change. I think the systems that we've been working in uh, are archaic. Um, they were developed back in the Industrial Revolution, applying scaling models that were intended for factories. <laughs> and they don't really match the needs that we have today and what we know about learning. So I think we need some big changes in our schools today. I, I'm feeling hopeful because I'm seeing it occurring in little places, like project-based learning is becoming a big thing. 
when kids have more choice about what they're going to do, um, what they're going to learn, how they're going to learn, um, rather than having it dictated to them. Um, and, you know, when you are, um, exp when you are living in, in trauma, you have very little choice. You know, you don't have, you, you have no exit. You can't leave, you know? So any place where you do have some choice and do have some autonomy is incredibly valuable and incredibly nourishing and helpful. So the more opportunities we can give for students have choice about where they sit, how they sit, what they do, who they interact with, um, and all those things, the better off and the more trauma sensitive our schools are going to have. Um, what can you explain what you mean by clarity? Um, so clarity. So, uh, so just to uh, so clarity. What I meant was being clear mm -hmm. what the expectations are. For example. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Very, very true. Yes. Um, so when students know what the expectations are, they're very clear, and they're reinforced. Um, consistently. So they know, they can trust, okay, this is what we do here and this is how we do it um, is really important. And this is good for all kids. Um, and there's there are some programs in the United States, one of them is called the Responsive Classroom, that has applied a lot of um, techniques and strategies that have been around for a long time. They're basically, you show children how to do something, you model it, um, so if you want them to line up a certain way, you practice it. You don't just tell them, go line up and then get upset when they don't do it right. You have to show them what the expectation is and reinforce it. Oh, look, our line is perfect. <laughs> You're all lined up exactly the way we do that, you know, and reinforce it and then remind them because especially depending on their age, especially young kids, which is most of my experience, they need reminding over and over and over again. So you have to be incredibly patient. Um, they forget, you know, they're impulsive. <laughs> they, that's the way they are. Um, and the other thing I think as educators we need to do is we need to remember they have a different, they have different priorities than we do. And they don't understand our priorities, you know, they, they are thinking about the world really differently than we are. Um, and so when we have an expectation, we have to understand that we have to explain that expectation in terms that they will understand, that they will be able to adopt in a way that makes sense for them, because otherwise it just is. It, they, they may just not even pay attention to it because it's not a priority for them. So how can we match our priorities with their priorities, you know? In ways that get those things met. And I think that's why, and I think the, this autonomy, this choice plays a big role in that. Because if we can give them even a little bit of choice in terms of how they do things or the way in which they do something, then they're going to be more bought in. They're going to feel more motivated to, to engage with us. Yeah, and if they have that clarity, they also have a base with which to make an appropriate choice. Right. right. Because they, they know the range the of right. They know the range of choices yeah. that they have. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So creating this container that has choices in it that are limited in a certain way, depending on their age, obviously, um, can be very beneficial. And then they learn how to make choices. Because if we don't give them choices, how are they even going to learn how to make good choices? <laughs> they and the other thing too. We have to give them a little bit of space to quote unquote misbehave because the way we learn self-regulation is by making mistakes. <laughs> if we don't even give them any opportunities to make some mistakes here and there, be dysregulated, then they can't learn to self-regulate. Um, and I think as adults, I know as a parent, that's tricky. You know, you've got to always be balancing your own concerns for their safety with their needs for some autonomy and some um, ability to make choices, even if they're bad choices. <laughs> yes. And also coming from generations where failure was just not accepted, right? Yes. Being parents or teachers who came yes. from a place where failure was just something that you did not do. And well, I actually have this article queued on my New York Times website that I haven't read yet, but it was it came out today and it's basically talking about freedom and children's um, inability to have any freedom today 
and how it's making everybody, making children anxious. And I haven't read it yet, but it makes sense to me. If we, if we over control our children, of course, they're going to be anxious because they never learn how to cope with challenging situations. So, you know, the extreme of trauma, we're all trying to protect our children from trauma, obviously. But in order for us to learn to be resilient, we need to have opportunities to make mistakes and encounter challenges and recover from them because that's how we build this resilience. Yes, I was thinking that not only do we not know how to cope with freedom or choice, but uh, we grow up to believe that we don't have, uh, that we don't know how to deal with it, that we're not strong enough, that we need that protection, right? That on our own, we wouldn't be able to do it. I remember my son said something to me, I think he might've been about 12. Um, and I think I was over mothering. I was worried about him. You know, at 12, 12 is one of those ages where you start to really worry. And he said, mom, when you say that to me, it makes me feel like you don't trust me. And I went, oh, and I said, I'm sorry. It's not that I don't trust you. It's that I don't trust the rest of the world. And it really shifted the way I approached him and made me like back off because uh, it made me realize, so oh, that's not helpful. I am so grateful for this conversation, for the work that you do. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, you said how none of this, all of this can be very useful to kids who have trauma, but it can be useful to everybody. You know, and I was thinking how so many of the things that you have said, if we have a society built on compassion, built on mindfulness, built on freedom, built on respect and choice and agency, built on clarity, I mean, that's all we need. You know, Maria, in the midst of all these challenging times, I have complete faith in human beings. I, you know, I have hope because not only can we do that, as you just said, but we have to. <laughs> and, and, and the other thing is, I also know today we have all the scientific knowledge we need to solve the problems we have. If we have the will and the sense of community, we can do it. So I have hope, and I think conversations like this give me even more hope. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's been so wonderful to speak with you today, and really grateful that you have joined us at Radica. Well, thank you for inviting me, and um, I appreciate uh, having an opportunity to speak to people outside of the United States, to those of you in Spain. España is a beautiful country and a beautiful culture. Thank you.